So welcome. Thank you. So you're having a great time here? Yes. Yes. Has the weather been sort of iffy? Yeah. yeah. A lot of rain? So I realized the first time I brought a group to interview you was in 2002. Mm -hmm. Because a student wrote you and you said yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to bring these guys to get a chance for them to ask a couple questions and well, meet, meet you. And thank you. It's really wonderful. Well, I'm honored to see each and every one of you and welcome. Well, so does somebody want to do an introduction? Go ahead, Cece. Hi, I'm Cece. We are the junior and senior class in Mount Madonna. And thank you so much for seeing us. We have some questions for you, but is there anything you'd like to say before that? Well, thank you very much. I'm happy and delighted to see you and uh, the group that come each year. Just a wonderful group. I enjoy being with all of the young people that come. Uh, only thing I would say, I've been here for a few years, but I first came to Washington, D.C. in 1961. I was 21 years old, had all of my hair and a few pounds lighter mm -hmm. to go on something called the Freedom Rides. Back in 1961, black people and white people couldn't be seated together on a bus leaving Washington, D.C. to travel through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. We were on our way to New Orleans to test the decision of the United States Supreme Court in and segregation on public transportation. But during those days, we saw the signs that said white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women. We wanted to bring down those signs. And so they are gone today. And the only places you see those signs today will be in a book, in a museum, on a video. I came back here in 1963 at the age of 23 to meet with President Kennedy along with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others. And in that meeting with President Kennedy, we told him we were going to march on Washington. And we planned and organized. We came back on August 28, 1963. And 10 of us spoke. I spoke number six, Dr. King spoke number 10, and out of the 10 people that spoke that day, I'm the only one still around. After the march was all over, President Kennedy invited us down to the White House. He stood in the door of the Oval Office, greeting each one of us. He was beaming like a proud father. He kept saying, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. King, he said, you did a good job and you had a dream. That was my last time seeing President Kennedy. And if someone had told me then that one day I would be back here as a member of Congress, I probably would have said, you're crazy, you're out of your mind, you don't know what you're talking about. So I said to you as young people, you will be the leaders of the 21st century. You must never give up or give in. You must keep the faith, keep dreaming, and keep your eyes on the prize to help redeem the soul of America, help make our country and our world a better place for generation yet unborn. You can do it. You can make a contribution. When I was growing up in rural Alabama and saw those signs that said white and colored, I would ask my mother, ask my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But I heard of Rosa Parks, I heard of Martin Luther King Jr., and I met Rosa Parks when I was 17. The next year at the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King Jr., and I got in trouble. But I call good trouble, necessary trouble, and I have not looked back since. So welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, I'm Holden. Despite more than 40 arrests, physical attacks, and serious injuries, you have remained a de devoted advocate of nonviolence. Could you tell us about the role nonviolence has played in your career as a politician and activist? The role of nonviolence has played a major role in my involvement uh, as an activist in the civil rights movement, in the peace movement, and as an elected official. I believe in the way of peace, 
in the way of love, in the way of nonviolence, as a way of life, as a way of living. Before we participated in any nonviolent direct action, we studied. We studied the life of Gandhi, the teaching of Gandhi. We studied what he attempted to accomplish in South Africa, what he accomplished in India. We studied Thoreau and civil disobedience. We studied the great religions of the world. We studied what Martin Luther King Jr. was all about. Before we participated in a sit-in, before we went on a freedom ride, or any marches. So it tell you, in effect, to respect the dignity and the worth of every human being, that you must never become bitter or hostile, and you never should hate. As Dr. King would say, hate is too heavy a burden to bear. Just love everybody. Hi, my name is Carolyn. In yes? an article for Here and Now, you said, the first time I got arrested, I felt free. I felt liberated. Can you talk about feeling free in the face of incarceration? Well, the first time I got arrested, it is true. I felt free. I felt liberated. I felt like I had crossed over because my family have told me, don't get in trouble. And I got in trouble. It was good trouble, necessary trouble. I will show you a photograph of my very first arrest. They were going to pull it out. This was my very, very first arrest. Um, one of the staff people here, staff members, uh, did a little research and he located this photograph of me being arrested. Now, uh, we had been sitting in for a while, black and white college students and some high school students at lunch counters and restaurants in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. And we had been told that if we come back again, we would be arrested. I wanted to look what some young people used to call fresh, a shop, if I were gonna to go to jail. So I had very little money, and two or three days earlier, I went to a used men's store, and I bought this suit, <laughs> and I paid $5 for it. I think I looked pretty good in the, in the suit for $5. If I still had it today, I probably could sell it on eBay uh, for a lot of money. <laughs> but, uh, and I didn't tell my mother or my father, any of my sisters or brothers about I'd been arrested and going to jail. But later they heard about it. And my sisters and brothers were very supportive. My mother was very worried. My father didn't say much, but I can tell that he was very proud of me. Um, hi, my name is Liam. In an interview about Martin Luther King Jr., you said, I just felt that he was speaking to me. Like he was saying, John Lewis, you can do it. You can get involved. You must get involved. And when I got the chance, I got involved. Have there been moments in your life uh, where you doubted yourself and that inspirational voice came back and tell you that you could do it? Well, I have never, ever doubted myself. Um, to hear Martin Luther King Jr. speaking on the old radio, or to be in the audience, and he's speaking to you, or to meet him, and you're shaking his hand, seem like he's, seem almost like it's a blessing. Like he's saying, it's okay, it's all right. Just go in peace, go with love, go with hope, with grace. For me, he was more than a source of inspiration. He was almost like a big brother. Uh, Ambassador Young, who worked with Dr. King, Ambassador Andrew Young, who had served in Congress and later became the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations during the Carter administration, said in a recent uh, film that Dr. King saw me as his spiritual son. I saw him almost as a big brother. Because if it hadn't been for Martin Luther King Jr., I don't know what would have happened to me. Some of you probably know this story from your studies and from reading that as a little boy, I wanted to be a minister. And 
We would raise chicken on the farm and we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and cousins were lined outside of the chicken yard. And I would start speaking to the chicken and preaching to the chicken. And I tell young people today, some of those chickens would bow their heads. Some of those chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But they tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. And some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they could just say. Talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you said, we worked together, we marched together, we got arrested together in Selma, Alabama. Could you tell us a personal memory you have from your time with Dr. King? Oh, Dr. King would ask me from time to time when we would be talking, and he would say, John, uh, do you still preach? And I would say, yes, Dr. King, when I'm taking a shower. And he would just laugh, just <laughs> laugh. He thought it was so funny. And on one occasion, we were riding in a car in uh, Alabama, and we saw some little restaurant, really was a hole in the wall, ordinarily wouldn't stop there, and he said, we should stop and get something to eat. If we get arrested and go to jail, we're going to full stomach. And then he just started laughing. <laughs> but he would tell jokes and try to be funny, and he always thought his jokes was funny. <laughs> and, and so we had to, you know, pretend it was funny. But he was a wonderful, wonderful man to get to know. Um, sometime I would go to his church, and he would be in a pulpit preaching. And his father, that we call Daddy King, would be there. And Daddy King would say to his son, Son, make it plain. Make it clear. Preach, son, and sometimes you start. He said, "Daddy, I'm doing that. I'm doing the best I can." <laughs> Hi, my name is Amelia. When Mountainona School interviewed Archbishop Desmond Tutu, he said, "If you do not forgive, you are actually tying yourself to the perpetrator. That you are going to live your life as a victim, and you won't experience a liberation that comes from forgiving." Can you talk about your experiences with forgiveness? Oh, I, I can tell you, um, you have to have the capacity and the ability and also be willing to forgive. Many, many years ago on the Freedom Ride, my seatmate was a young white gentleman from Connecticut. And we took a Greyhound bus with others from here through the South, through Virginia, through North Carolina, and we arrived in South Carolina, and a young group of men, members of the Klan, attacked us, beat us, and left us lying in the pool of blood at the Greyhound bus station, where we tried to enter a so-called white waiting room. Many years later, to be exact, many years later, in old nine, one of the members of the Klan in his 70s and his son in his 40s came to this office and he said, Mr. Lewis, I'm one of the people that beat you and your seatmate. And he said, I want to apologize. Will you forgive me? He said, I'm sorry. His son started crying. He started crying. And I said, I forgive you. I accept your apology. They hugged me. I hugged them back. And I cried with them. When you forgive, when you have the power to forgive and lay down the burden, you're reconciled. You become almost one. And it's to me, it is the most powerful experience you can have. That's what the movement was all about, to be reconciled. That is the goal, to bring people together. And when I'm traveling around the American South, I run into people all the time, whether it's in Birmingham or Montgomery or in Georgia or someplace in Mississippi, people are saying, I'm sorry what happened. And I said, don't be sorry. It's okay. It's all right. 
and we hug and we cry. We shed tears. You lay down the burden of the past and you move on. That's what was so good about South Africa, going through that period of truth and reconciliation. And maybe in America, we need to do it. Yes? Uh, if you were having an executive session with yourself, as a young man of our age, given what you know now, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I would say so self. I just want to talk back to myself. <laughs> but, but, but I would say, John Lewis, continue on the path of peace, on the path of love and grace, and never give up. Be hopeful, be optimistic, and don't get lost in a sea of despair. And be happy. I don't know how many of you saw it, maybe you're too young to remember, when the Happy Song came out, there was a video of me dancing to the music, happy. I love the song. Be, just be happy, enjoy life. Be happy, whatever you do, be happy. Never be down, be, just be up. I'm still kind of in disbelief that we just talked to John Lewis. Hearing his stories were amazing, and just all the pictures in his room with Martin Luther King and uh, JFK, and it was just incredible. 